Our commentator Tessa Dunlop and I'm also joined by Professor Richard Hindley, a consultant urological surgeon. I'm going to start with you, Professor, and thank you so much for joining us. Can you can you talk about this procedure, you know, dealing with and, and taking care of, maybe getting rid of, you're going to tell me, an enlarged prostate? What we hear a great deal since yesterday's announcement from the King is this is very, very common in gentlemen over a certain age and becomes more common the older a gentleman gets. But we don't necessarily know exactly what the problem or issue is and how you deal with it. Of course, no, thank you for asking me to talk to you. It's a very, very common condition, and I would say in the order of three million men in the UK will have some symptoms from benign enlargement. In some cases, there'll be fairly mild or modest symptoms, and in others, more severe, and for a significant proportion of men, surgery will be required. And the usual way that we do this sort of surgery is to go up through, you know, we call it endoscopic surgery. We go up through the natural orifice, the urethra, and we use various different techniques and procedures to um, open up a better passageway through the prostate gland, because as we get older, the prostate gland enlarges and causes a, a blockage, a narrowing, a kinking of the urethra, of the water pipe. And as a result of that, we get, we have troublesome urinary symptoms. So it's a very, very common problem. Um, and there are a sort of portfolio of different ways that we can do the surgery. And there isn't one particular treatment that's suitable for everybody. There are a number of different ways of doing it, but they're all quite similar, um, involving different technologies to open up a passageway through the prostate, uh, th thereby, in most cases, alleviating symptoms, improving the urine flow, reducing daytime frequency of urination and urgency, and some men, you know, get up more at night than they would like to, and they're sort of typical symptoms, really. I, I forgive the crudeness of this expression, but um, I have many family members actually who are surgeons, and they, they they describe this procedure as coring out a little bit as you might core out an apple. Would you say that's crude and, and inaccurate, or is it pretty much that type of a thing? Uh, the the operation historically that we have done a lot of over the years, and many other countries in the world have, is called a TURP where we, through the urethra, core out or remove prostate tissue. There are a number of sort of iterations of this and technologies and treatments that are similar. So I guess on a sort of basic level, it is pouring out of the prostate cavity, but it, it, yeah, it's probably not best described in that way, but it's based on a sort of operation that we used to do a lot of, and we, we, we have, did sort of tend to use that sort of terminology, yes. Right, and, and tell me about life for gentlemen after the operation. How is life? Is it is it pretty normal? Is urinating normal? Is sexual activity normal? Or, or are you kind of affected by this operation? Uh, I think that, um, in, with, in, you know, in expert hands, which I'm sure you will be in, um, it, it's very likely that sexual function will be preserved in the main and, and, and the urinary symptoms will improve. Obviously, I don't have insight into the exact nature, you know, the, the exact problems, because there is a variation and some men have to have a catheter because they can't pass urine. The majority are just having troublesome symptoms that are impacting on quality of life. Um, so the likelihood is, yes, in, in the vast majority of patients, there is a significant improvement in the in the daytime and nighttime urinary symptoms with with. Um, a very small risk of side effects, but there's not there's not no risk, but a, but a modest risk with the new, um, you know, technologies and treatments and the way that we do things. Professor, one of the reactions to uh, King Charles having made his condition public and the procedure that he's going to have public has been a real outpouring of, I would say, the word is gratitude from the medical profession, yeah. from urologists such as yourself, from other gentlemen who've been diagnosed, from their grateful wives, from all sorts of people saying, gosh, this is a really terrific thing that the King has done because he could have done this quietly and he could have said, you know, my, my, my symptoms are my own, I'm going to share any of my medical conditions with anybody, it's my own business, but he's made a particular point of publicising this. And this is largely, I think I'm right in saying, because some men are just shy to go to the doctor about this. Some men just refuse to take any notice of it and hope it'll go away. And what we really want to do on programmes like mine is to kind of make it known that really the right thing to do is go and get yourself checked out. No, absolutely. I completely agree. As per our British Association of Urological Surgeons uh, statement, I think, we, you know, we are really grateful for the fact that uh, the King has 
shared this with us because you, you're right, men aren't particularly very good at going to their doctor and, and talking about day-to-day -day urinary symptoms. And, it, and in the majority of cases, men who are getting older with troublesome urinary symptoms don't have cancer of the prostate. They have this benign, non-cancerous enlargement. So it's, it's, a really, it's really a welcome thing that, that this has been shared with us. And, and I, I think you're right, there's been a real sort of outpouring, and it really does help raise the profile of this very, very common health problem that, that traditionally hasn't really received much um, attention, but, it, but it's a really big problem. It's, it's, a, it's just part of ageing that the prostate enlarges. Um, so, no, we're, we're all very grateful. And we know that it's a particular problem, a particular scourge, isn't it, in the Black and Afro-Caribbean community? Um, and, and, and that's a community in which we really do want that situation and condition to be publicised as much as possible so that men can come and get, get help and, 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 you know, and, and lead excellent lives of great quality and not suffer. No, absolutely. That, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, and, and if we can reach out to those, um, you know, it, it's into those sort of minor, ethnic minorities and those people at risk of enlargement and prostate cancer, um, and, and encourage them to come forwards and not be embarrassed. That, that, that's, that's a very good thing. Professor, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Let me bring in Tessa Dunlop. Good to see you, Tessa. Um, this is a kind of break with protocol and tradition, isn't it? The King being so generous in, you know, sharing his very private condition with the nation. And he's doing it with, with excellent purpose and for good reason. Indeed, apparently the numbers of people looking up prostate on the NHS website site last night went up significantly. Mm -hmm. um, so we can confirm that, um, uh, forgive me, it's school pickup time and everyone seems to be calling my telephone. <laughs> um, we can confirm. And I was thinking, gosh, as, the, as they're ringing me, I'm thinking, God, that's a problem. Can you imagine Kate with three children just to jump subjects there, yes. uh, having to reschedule all her uh, different appearances as a mother, let alone as, as Princess Royal. But back uh, to prostate. Yeah, I noticed on the NHS website last night um, that numbers had, had gone up of people looking into the question of prostate. But more broadly, I think, um, when it comes to Charles's announcement, by letting us in uh, to this very private matter in an unprecedented way, because normally historically the royals are extremely private um, about uh, health matters. I think in some ways he was deflecting from Kate. Um, there was, if you like, uh, subliminally messaging there that, look, we're prepared to tell you this, but don't go there. That's private. And I thought it was quite canny the way in which the two statements backed one off the other. And, and, and as far as William and Kate are concerned, another, you might say, break with royal protocol in terms of, you know, Prince William saying absolutely categorically, I'm cutting back on my royal duties because my first duty and my foremost concern is my wife and my children. Now, there will be people, I'm quite sure, and some of them might be watching this programme right now, thinking, well, hang on a minute, you know, you've got a nanny, you know, you've got servants who work for you you know everybody else when their wife is ill still has to go to work and they still have to find a childminder and they often prevail upon family members and it's a terrific strain for anybody when one of two parents of young children is ill not everybody does scale back their own work and not everybody can but I suppose there'll be lots of other people maybe the majority of people thinking fantastic you know absolutely this is the right thing to do when 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 you're in these very trying and worrying circumstances uh, it's interesting because the royal family are uh, our first family and in many ways we see ourselves in them but by the definition of who they are they're also above us they live and exist in a very different world so on one level we all think oh our dad's got a prostate too dad you check your prostate yeah. and on another level we can't compare William and Kate's conditions school pickups work environment with our own because they're non-comparable but at the same time as they may be privileged in that respect i think we have to bear in mind just how physically taxing it must be to constantly be the focus of public attention and actually i heard you there uh, talking as usual with, with great insights sarah hewitson about the royal family but if there's ever a time when they can afford to be a bit slim down it's at the moment They've gone full pelt for years. We've had the enormous Mexit storm. Then we had a giant funeral. Then we had a gargantuan coronation. And to be fair, this time of year, it's pretty quiet anyway. 
Charles and Camilla have got their long haul visit at the back end of the year in New Zealand and Australia. So I think that will be the focus to recuperate and recover for them. But arguably, and both these procedures are planned, I, I think it's both fortuitous and good programming that they've fallen now when actually there's a lull anyway. Who's doing what in January and February, Vanessa? I mean, I don't know how full your diary is, but a lot of people are sort of still uh -huh. hibernating. And I think that this, if there ever was a good time, it, it is right now. 